Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest of Field Fisher's webinar series. Uh, today is a very special topic, picking up on a topic that we discussed in our recent in privacy, um, in, sorry, in person privacy summit held at our London office. Uh, this topic is transparency and privacy notices. My name is Hazel Grant, and I am the head of data privacy based in our London office. Thank you very much for joining us. When I heard about today's topic, I elbowed aside all the other Field Fisher privacy partners and said, that one is mine. And that's because I think it's a really core topic for data protection compliance and also for data subjects. I don't know if regulators would agree with me, but I think some of the enforcements indicate that they do think that privacy notices are really important. They've moved from looking at purely security breaches in the early days of uh, May 2018 and afterwards, and looked at wider compliance, things like what's in your privacy notice and how good are you at delivering it to everybody who needs it, for example, BizNode and Experian cases. So what we're going to learn from my colleagues is the impact of that regulatory enforcement and the changes that we're seeing in privacy notice from the ones we all drafted in 2018. So before we meet our speakers, um, I'll introduce myself. You've heard my name is Hazel. I head up the privacy team. And when I'm not uh, dealing with data protection issues and looking at guidance or cases, I can be found surrounding, surrounded by many, many animals, cats, dogs, horses, chickens, quails, sheep, etc. I don't quite live on a farm, but it feels like that sometimes. So I will hand over to my colleague. Uh, let's start with Martin. Maybe you could introduce yourself. Thanks, Hazel, and, and hi, everyone. Yeah, uh, my name is Martin McElroy. I'm a senior data protection advisor in the tech and data team here at Field Fisher. I'm also Field Fisher's data protection officer. Um, I don't quite have the farm that Hazel has. So I just have a couple of wild children that I mostly act as taxi driver for and uh, look after an elderly cat. Thanks very much, Martin. Anna, maybe you could say hello. Thanks, Hazel. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Rawlinson, and I'm a senior associate in uh, London Data and Tech team. When I don't uh, do data protection in those, in those moments, I usually run around after my two boys and uh, uh, let them teach me to play football, which apparently I'm really bad at but getting a bit better. <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. And Annie, can you introduce yourself, please? I can, thanks Hazel. Um, I'm Annie, um, also known as Anne-Marie McLaughlin. I am a solicitor in the Field Fisher technology and data team, and I'm afraid I don't have um, quite as much going on <laughs> in my life, but I, do, I am a cat mum as well. Um, oh. So, fun fact. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there you have it. There's the team for this afternoon. Um, a few words about housekeeping and the broader Field Fisher family, if I can put it that way. Uh, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe, Silicon Valley and China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are a very collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. And I know you're going to hear a lot about that in this webinar. So looking at housekeeping, there, uh, please do ask us questions uh, during this uh, webinar. I'll try to fit them in when I can. If I can't, um, I will hold them to the end and we'll hopefully have a little bit of time to deal with them then. If we don't answer them today, we will get back to you by email. There is a question function on your panel, so please pop the questions in there. We will finish at 5 p.m. UK today. Um, later this week, we will be sending you a copy of the slides and also a recording, so don't feel that you have to scribble everything down as we go along. And lastly, please do subscribe to our blog and keep an eye out for uh, future webinars and sessions over the coming weeks and months. So let's have a look at what we're going to cover today. So we have, um, let's start with the basics, you know, privacy notices, why does it matter? What is, why is this topic important? I've maybe given you a very personal view as to why I think that is the case at the moment, but we're going to hear from Annie about this in a minute. 
we're going to look at some of the regulatory decisions which are shaping what our privacy notices will need to look at right now. And we'll be looking at things in both a, an EU and a UK perspective and seeing the similarities. We're going to look at the key tensions between legal requirements to present certain information and the practical challenges of doing that in a way that is understandable by data subjects. And lastly, we're going to look at how you apply um, transparency requirements in practice, perhaps most uh, challenging issue. So without further ado, let's get into the meat of this. And I think I'm handing over now to Annie, please. Thanks, Hazel. So why do privacy notices matter? There are a whole host of reasons why privacy notices matter. Obviously, firstly, it is a legal requirement under the GDPR. And as we will demonstrate in a moment, transparency obligations are a subject of regulatory focus, and we are seeing high fines in this area, particularly for larger organisations. We are also seeing data subjects' expectations evolving on this topic, with data subjects more aware of their rights than ever before. Another reason is that privacy notices are, in many cases, the window that your customers, data subjects, activist groups and regulators can all easily look through to assess your organisation's approach to data protection. Essentially, it says a lot about an organization's data protection maturity level and how an organization chooses to present itself from a data protection perspective. As privacy notices are easily accessible for all to see, we think they should be in good order. Um, that said, and notwithstanding the ICO's suggestion that there is no need for your privacy notice to be long and complicated, for many medium to large organisations, applying the transparency principles in practice is a difficult task, um, but one that does bring commercial benefits. So hopefully your organisation can see this as an opportunity, um, perhaps to build trust, trust um, to strengthen your brand. Um, and if nothing else, having a privacy notice that is up to date and aligned with the latest regulatory guidance can be um, a really useful tool for other businesses, business purposes. Um, or even perhaps when things go wrong. For example, organisations look, um, look at other organisations' privacy notices as part of due diligence, either contractual or in the context of a sale. Um, we also often see clients going back to their privacy notice um, during regulatory investigations, when responding to DSARs um, or complaints. The privacy notice can be a really helpful point um, to um, a focus point when forming a robust response um, if they are kept up to date and compliant um, it can be really useful. So first of all we were going to just show you um, some of the um, key decisions um, that have uh, been made since um, the DPC began investigating WhatsApp in May 2018. Um, so, Hazel, if we could just flip, to, that's perfect. Um, since the DPC began investigating WhatsApp in May 2018, there have been a number of regulatory decisions and fines that have been issued which relate either in whole or in part um, to deficiencies in the organisation's privacy notices and transparency failures. We will talk about the key takeaways from the DPC decisions in a moment and to a lesser extent the recent ICO decisions. These are only the main decisions um, that have been issued in this regard. And whilst the level of fines are not always super high, um, this is an area that has been consistently um, the subject of regulatory scrutiny. So first of all, we're going to turn to the WhatsApp decision um, handed down in July 2021 which was announced following the Irish DPC's investigation into whether WhatsApp had discharged its transparency obligations, which included providing information to data subjects about the processing of their information um, within the wider Facebook group, as it then was. The DPC's investigation stemmed from a number of complaints from users, non-users and the German regulator. With WhatsApp services being so prevalent in Europe, it became a really big case when a number of supervisory authorities expressed their views on the initial DPC's draft um, report, with eight supervisory authorities raising objections and seven exchanging comments on the decision. 
The DPC referred the objections to the EDPB for determination as they were unable to reach a consensus with the um, other concerned supervisory authorities. The EDPB then adopted a decision under the Article 65 mechanism and the DPC's updated decision incorporated a number of the points in the EDPB decision. Following that, WhatsApp filed a statutory appeal and judicial review in Ireland, which is still ongoing, um, and applied to the EU's general court to annul the EDPB decision, which was rejected. The EDPB's decision contained clear instructions that required the DPC to reassess and increase its proposed fine, which was initially envisaged as between 30 to 50 million to 225 million euros which was at the time a landmark level of fine. It also gave WhatsApp only three months uh, to bring its processing activities into compliance, as opposed to the six month time period, which was initially proposed by the DPC to reflect their, uh, to, sorry, to rectify their activities. Essentially, the DPC following the EDPs, <coughs> sorry, essentially the DPC following the EDPP's directions found that WhatsApp failed to provide users with the privacy information under Article 13, non-users with the relevant information under Article 14, and the um, information in an easily accessible form under Article 12. And as a, result, as a result, WhatsApp were said to have breached the overarching transparency principle in Article 5. We will focus on the key decisions from that, uh, sorry, the key lessons from that decision and how to apply them in practice throughout this webinar. Before we do though, following the 2021 WhatsApp decision, the EDPB then handed down two further decisions relating to transparency failures against meta companies, Facebook and Instagram in, Jan Janu in January this year. Oh, I think we've just lost the slides for a second there. Um, I'll carry on. Um, both Please made do. important. <laughs> okay, right. um, both made important points on transparency, but reinforced the earlier 2021 decision. The focus of these decisions was mainly on transparency around lawful basis and how granular you have, have to be when explaining the lawful basis in the context of contractual necessity. An important point raised is that transparency may impact on the validity of lawful basis and on fairness of processing. If you fail to provide transparent information on lawful bases, that might undermine, undermine lawfulness of processing and may also lead to processing being found to be unfair. This is particularly relevant when there is a, an imbalance of power. For example, when you have a large service provider and users or as otherwise referred to as a take it or leave it situation. The decision also included a few practical points, including around the separation between um, the terms of services and privacy notices. There are two separate, they are two separate documents um, and they have different functions. There shouldn't be any confusion between the two. It also stated that accept buttons on privacy notices should be avoided um, as asking for acceptance can cause confusion around whether consent is being relied upon and it may also raise issues around forced consent. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, um, we didn't want to finish off this section without a quick slide on what is happening in the UK. Um, until recently, people might have thought that the ICO post-Brexit might take a different approach um, as compared to the European regulators. We don't think this is the case based on these two recent decisions that you can see on the screen. So firstly, we have the Experian decision issued in February this year. This decision appealed an enforcement notice issued by the ICO in relation to its direct marketing arm. The ICO had found against Experian on key issues of transparency um, and lawful basis. Interestingly, the tribunal rejected the ICO's view that Experian's privacy notice was not transparent, but nonetheless, we do think this case gives an insight into the approach that the ICO is taking. Some key takeaways from the tribunal decision include that information layers, hyperlinks and expandable headings are good techniques to overcome the, overcome the tension um, between providing large amounts of information and avoiding information overload. And the decision 
also makes clear that privacy notices can be provided via third parties, provided that there is a sufficiently easy to follow hyperlink trail um, from one notice to another. More recently, in April this year, the UK Commissioner, uh, Commissioner fined TikTok £12.7 million, pounds, including um, for failures to provide the information required under Article 13 of the UK GDPR to data subjects in a concise, transparent, intelligible and easily accessible form using clear and plain language, in particular in relation to information addressed sp specifically to children. Interestingly, in its penalty notice, the ICO referenced the WhatsApp case, the EU transparency guidance and meta decisions uh, showing clear alignment with the EDPB's approach. TikTok tried to argue that transparency standards are very difficult to comply with in practice, which I think many can empathise with, um, but the ICO had little sympathy and stated that practical diff difficulties do not justify non-compliance. And so I think whilst the ICO's latest template privacy notice and related guidance would suggest a potentially lighter touch approach, as for example, the template is far less granular than the WhatsApp decision um, sort of requires, this template focuses on the needs of small to medium sized businesses and probably assumes straightforward processing. Our view is that this doesn't follow the recent ICO's decisions. Um, and for the majority of our clients, we don't think it is particularly relevant, but we're noting it here just for completeness. Importantly, given the recent enforcement decision, especially in relation to TikTok, um, it is now clear to us that there are not separate or lesser rules that are going to apply in the UK. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'm now going to hand you over to Martin, who will talk you through transparency requirements and where to find them. Thank you, Annie. Um, yeah, so if, if Annie has left you feeling slightly anxious and maybe sweating, wondering about you know, whether your privacy notice is up to speed, um, and, and you know, she is known as our enforcer for good reason, um, it is worth, I think, taking a bit of a step back and, and, and recapping where those key tr transparency legal requirements actually come from. Um, so there's an element of, of going back to basics here, and, and, and for that we need to look again at the GDPR itself, uh, specifically Articles 12, 13 and 14, uh, and as, as, as Annie referenced, um, the uh, Article 29 Working Party uh, Transparency Guidelines. So we'll, we will look at um, some of the Article 12 uh, requirements in a little bit more detail over, uh, over the next few slides, but but as, as it says on the screen, with Article 12, you must uh, provide information in a way that's concise, transparent, intelligible, easily accessible, in a clear and plain language, and, and, and age appropriate, uh, and therefore child-centered language, if, if, if relevant and if possible, uh, as simple as possible. And we've seen some specific guidance on that um, from the UK's ICO. Um, you will also need to provide all of the, the information listed in Articles uh, 13 and 14 of the GDPR, or 13 or 14, I, I should say, depending on what's relevant to you. Um, Article 13, just as a quick recap, Article 13 is, uh, it covers when the data is collected directly from uh, the data subject. Article 14, it covers when the, the data is indirectly uh, obtained from, uh, from the data subject, um, or not directly from them. So, some differences be between the two, but broadly, the, both these articles mandate that privacy notices need to include things like the identity and contact details of the, of the controller, uh, the contact details of, of, of the DPO, um, the purposes of processing and the legal basis for processing, the categories of personal data concerned, recipients of, of data or categories of, of recipients where applicable, and any information uh, regarding uh, uh, data transfers to third third countries, as well as you know, uh, additional information like retention periods and so on. Now, Anna, Anna will cover this in a little bit more detail later on in, in the uh, in this uh, webinar. But um, uh, specifically, you also need to um, uh, detail where le legitimate interests are, are relied upon. You must provide specific details on this. And of course, um, uh, both Articles 12 and 13. Um, uh, require information on what data subject rights are available and applicable and contact details on how to exercise those. 
so again, you know, just you know, having heard all of this, you know, it is always worth going back and looking at the at the original uh, articles themselves for some for, for some initial guidance. And then, you know, we would we would recommend that you follow up, um, as as Annie referenced as well, with the, the the Article 29 Working Party Transparency Guidelines from from 2018, and and like like the guidelines from Working Party 29 as well as you know the the subsequent guidance from EDPB. This is you know this is obviously um, further interpretation and then practical guidance and 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 assistance with. Uh, with with respect to transparency obligations in this case um, um you know they offered a bit more detail and specific specificity on the meaning of phrases such as you know concise transparent intelligible easily accessible um in writing or by other means as well as information what should be provided uh, and how to provide that information to, to data subjects and you know the the, the importance of of these guidelines is is i think neatly summarized by uh, by Helen Dixon on on the screen there, um, uh, Helen uh, Dixon, Ireland, Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner, um, who noticed that there was clear divergence um, and inconsistencies between the contents of the the transparency guidelines um, and the approach taken by WhatsApp in in, in that finding. Um, and, and as Annie mentioned, the, the importance of the transparency guidelines, also noted by the ICO, who referred them referred to them in their their TikTok decision, um, you know, obviously highlighting the relevance to to, to the UK uh, as well as uh, as the EU. So, again, if you want to refresh yourself on on uh, where all of this is derived from, go back to the GDPR articles and and yeah, I think go back to the transparency guidelines for a little bit more detail and and legal background. And so on to the next one, please, Hazel. Thank you. And yeah, of course, this is you know uh, it's what we do. We 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 deal with legal theory, but you know in practice, uh, there, there could be a huge difference between the the legal requirement and and the practical real world challenges for for all of us, uh, you know, for all of us on on the call as as data controllers. Uh, and I think the the graphic on screen neatly shows the, the the tension between these two sides. It is it's it's a bit of an arm wrestle. There's a, there's an element of sort of almost a, a cognitive dissonance, if if I can use that that fancy phrase of, of sort of having you know two different kind of thoughts at once um, on 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 this on this particular topic. And it's it, it it's a it it can be difficult to kind of strike to strike the balance. So you know, in addition to the to legal requirements that we've touched on. Annie also highlighted um, that you know that a lot of the regulatory enforcement um, in these privacy notice cases has been was actually derived from the complainants themselves. You know, it's, it's the customers of the tech companies. It's maybe you know, civil society groups as, such as NYOB, journalists, um, em employees, and so on, as well as uh, other data protection regulators. Um, so end users clearly have a role in all, in all of this as well. You know, they're the ones that are complaining to regulatory authorities. These complaints are not clearly not being unnoticed by the regulators who are, are obviously responding to them and, and following up with uh, with enforcement. Um, and you know, and, and in contrast to this, you know, the legal theory and this regulatory pressure, we have um, all of you and, and other controllers who, who who then need to go off and present concise, intelligible privacy notices in, in clean, plain, clear, plain language, as it's said on the previous screen. Um, and, and in order to do that, you know, we we need to know things, you know, and understand our, our organisations. We need to know the personal data that we process, what those data flows look like, and so on. And you know, all all of these things take time, and 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 a, and a very clear understanding of what uh, your organisation is doing. It, you know, how well you know your data, and so on. And and again, Anna's going to touch on that in a little bit more detail uh, in a few slides time. And you know, the, the other challenge that we, we certainly see a lot of clients deal with as well is. There's, there's a real world problem about how you actually are going to present your privacy notice. You know, should that be in a, should the notice be in a, in the form of a table? Should it be in a long form format, long single format? Should it be layered? Uh, should it be modular? Um, and even in terms of the content, you know, you know, should it be a video? Should we, should we even be considering text? You know, what, what's the best way to actually deliver all these things? And, and for for some organisations and certainly you know some of some of our clients you know th these things take time. There's an effort. You know there's, these things cost mo money, and that needs to be balanced you know, against the the risk appetite of the organisation. 
Um, but you know, that might be our experience uh, for, for, for some of you on the call, for, for, for others uh, that we know. Um, but you know, we, we should take note of what Annie said, that you know, the regulators have very little sympathy for these practical concerns and, and, and companies uh, you know, that have been subject to enforcement. They are given short time frames within which to, to update their notices uh, very quickly. Um, so how do we tackle these um, these different issues? How do we tackle this tension and, and, and try and blend all these elements together into something a bit more meaningful? Hazel is way ahead of me and uh, we are moving into some of the good practice areas uh, around this. Uh, and again, Anna will, will touch on some of these elements in a little bit more detail, but uh, I thought I'd spend a couple of slides um, trying to focus on and I'd highlight some of the, the good and bad areas of, of the formatting of, of, of privacy notices and in particular, in particular the accessibility of them. And so on the screen we've, we've set out some um, uh, good examples um, from the transparency guidelines and actually I need to you know, give some credit to uh, some of the attendees at our recent uh, privacy summit that, that Hazel mentioned as well who, who came up with some really good practical uh, tips as well that we've, we've included here on this list. Um, so you know how you display your privacy notice on your website app as we, we've mentioned clearly needs to be considered. The document needs to be easily accessible, I, you know, it should be immediately apparent to the data subject where and how they can access the information um, and you know if in doubt um, you know uh, we discussed this at our, at our summit you know the, uh, it's always a good idea you know just get get a sample of users within your co company or, or some people that you, that you know external to the company to, to test how that how that actually works or how easy is it to find your privacy notices on your website um, and, and to provide some feedback on that. Um, the information needs to be accessible and, and ideally not on one continuous page of, of on broken text that the data subject has to scroll through. Uh, short shortcuts could be used, for example, in order to make the, the notice even more accessible. Um, you know, we we see a lot of companies do it well by using um, you know an index with hyperlinks uh, in, in maybe in the side column of, of the the notice so that key sections remain visible and, and, and easily accessible throughout. Um, Alternatively, you, you know, you, some 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 organisations always have a, a a kind of link back to the top of the of the text in their their privacy notices, so that when you scroll through, you always have that opportunity uh, to get back nice and early, um, easily to the uh, to the to the list of contents and the, and the other sections. Um, but you know, as it says on the screen, the, the do's are uh, hopefully fairly clear. You know, you know, where possible, use clear, concise language. Use hyperlinks within the document, and as Annie said, they, they go directly to other documents. Um, you know, make it easy for the reader to navigate between these various sections. You know, through the use of hyperlinks. Um, ideally, again, information that's that's that, that's linked or signposted to another document must be no further than one click away. Again, just to make that as easy as possible. Use layers as appropriate. The ICO in particular likes likes that layered approach with the privacy notices, so that you can. Um, open up more information. You know, should you should you need to to find that? And increasingly, you know, we're seeing, um, particularly in, in in light of the the WhatsApp um, decision, we're seeing uh, the use of tables a lot more to kind of summarise and simplify um, uh, the, the, the structure of data processed uh, lawful basis and 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 so on. And again, Anna will will touch on this in a little bit more detail later. Um, I mean, and, and if feasible, engage with your, your your customers or your your stakeholders and ask ask them, you know, as as your audience, you know, what what's important to them, you know, what points would they like to see covered? Uh, if there, you know, anything in particular that they would like to be highlighted um, in the privacy notice, you know, in addition to or or, or you know, specifically within the you know the the, the mandated requirements within uh, Articles 13 and 14. Um, you know that information then could be used to prioritize what you what you put at the top. You know what, what's the most engaging element and and and, and to help draw your um, your readers in. And it's also worth it. And this was uh, again somebody I think at our privacy summit uh, who made a good suggestion of you know run your run your privacy the text of your privacy notice through a read a you know an online readability test to see if it's you know get a get a score how good it is how simple it is to read. So overall, you know, the, the information in your notice should be delivered in a concise but meaningful way that allows the reader to understand the processing that you're doing and how to understand the rights. Um, you know, if possible, try to avoid you know, information overload, information fatigue, and, and, and make it easy as possible for them. 
So that's the good stuff. Uh, the bad stuff is on the next slide. Yep. Um, so yeah, we, we would just briefly run through the list. Um, you know, the, the, as we've touched on the previous one, the, the, the big recommendation is, is certainly don't don't have a single unbroken scroll of, of, of or, or you know list of text that uh, just has to be churned through. That is um, just you know, nobody will want to read that. Um, but other other you know other other bits of, of uh, other suggestions from uh, the, the guidelines you know include things like you know. Avoiding embedded documents and, and make sure a hyperlink does link to another one. Um, avoid, you know, avoid a kind of piecemeal approach to to the provision of information. Um, you know, it, it make sure everything flows and connects nicely, um, sticks to the requirements of um, of the articles and and, and and includes you know useful information. Um, avoid hypothetical language. You know, avoid the use of may or you know including um, and, and trying to be as specific as possible. Um, you know, and again, avoid you know, over oversupply of high level generalized information. You know, avoid inconsistency, repetition. You know, all the good stuff. I mean, you know, the the way I would look at it is you know you treat your privacy notice like you would treat any document that you produce. You know, any any communication you produce as a, as a business, you, you you will want that document to be clear, intelligible, and easily understood by whatever reader you know you're you're trying to to, to reach, um, and 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 provide you know appropriate contact information if 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 that reader had any questions. So you know. To me, you, leaving aside the the regulatory requirements, you know, there, there's a there's a good basic sort of document writing um, set of principles that you know you can apply to the privacy notice as well as you do to any other you know memo or document that you that that you you might write. And uh, I think at that point, I am going to hand over to Anna, who is who is I've kind of highlighted already, is is going to cover a number of these areas in a, a little bit more detail. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thanks, Martin. So Martin has taken us through uh, how the information needs to be provided. And we'll now move on to the Article 13 territory, which is all about uh, what information needs to be included in a privacy notice. When it comes to uh, the content of a privacy notice, the key word um, that you will need to think about is granularity. And it really is a headline word from, from, from the WhatsApp decision. Um, not necessarily anything new, because we know that these requirements for granularity have been highlighted by the regulators for some time. Um, as mentioned before, the working parties um, transparency guidelines. But what the WhatsApp decision has done is the DPC has applied those transparency guidelines in a very thorough way and with some serious consequences. And there is no doubt that the level of the fine has drawn people's attention to, to the issue of how granular those privacy notices really need to be. And whilst Article, Articles 13 and Article 14 um, include those quite long lists of um, various categories of information that needs to be provided, and Martin has uh, run us through those categories. Um, the key takeaways from the WhatsApp decision and, and also those others, other regulatory decisions that Anis mentioned focus on um, five, uh, five areas, five main areas, which we have shortlisted, and you can see the shortlist on the slide here. And the first one, the first requirement is the requirement to um, establish a link between the categories of personal data, uh, their process for specific processing um, activities, uh, useful specific processing activities, and the purposes of those processing activities, and then link that to lawful bases that are relied on for those purposes. The second point on our list is um, describing the way how granular you need to be to describe um, lawful basis and the DPC has focused particularly on the legitimate interest and uh, legal obligations. And then the next, uh, next area, next requirement um, uh, that causes um, difficulties in practice are, um, is providing information about recipients of your data and if those recipients are in third countries whether that will be adequate countries or non-adequate countries, uh, then you will also need to provide information on international data transfers. 
And the last point on our short list is um, around uh, informa relates to information about retention periods and retention of your data. And of course, the the consideration in the WhatsApp decisions and other um, the GPC has has talked um, about other requirements as well. But we uh, we've decided to focus on the, these five um, areas today because in practice we see that these are exactly the areas where um, providing the information at the level of granularity that uh, we now know is expected by the regulators and at the same time doing it in a way that is concise, clear, um, you know, succinct and easily accessible really poses uh, a significant practical challenge for most organizations, if not for all. Um, so now thinking about the challenge and how to uh, best tackle it, um, uh, let's move on to a very important lesson from the WhatsApp decision. And then next slide, thank you. Uh, and this is all about the importance of preparation. When you think back to those early GDPR days, uh, you know, five, now five years ago, um, back then privacy notices were very generic um, and they, they included kind of high level descriptions. And with that, it, it wasn't really that much effort that was required to put together a privacy notice. But things have certainly changed. They have evolved and then post WhatsApp, it has become clear that to prepare a privacy notice to the standards that regulators are expecting, you will need to put in quite a lot of um, groundwork. Um, and that's because to provide um, the information required at the level of granularity um, that, that it, it needs to be um, provided, you really need to know your processing. You need to understand the types of categories of data that you're processing. Um, you need to understand your data flows, know your recipients, uh, know retention. Um, so all those elements that really go to a kind of decent level of data protection maturity. And if that's in place, well, that's great. But if not, um, gathering that information can be quite, uh, can involve quite, quite a bit of effort. And in that, that stage uh, of information gathering, um, you, will, you will primarily look to uh, you know you look at a couple of the documents your internal compliance documents and your first and, and main port of call uh, will be article 30 records uh, but you might also find useful any data flow maps that your organization might have developed uh, retention schedules and if those documents are you know up to date and complete that's that's fantastic that means that a big part of your job is done um, but we know that in practice, it not, it's not necessarily always the case. Um, so if you are in that kind of scenario, then um, you, you should probably prepare yourself for the fact that an update of privacy notice uh, these days might almost turn into a mini GDPR audit when you have to kind of identify your compliance gaps and um, also address them before you can move on to uh, the, the finalizing and, and publishing your draft. So preparation is something to certainly keep in mind. Um, and keeping in, with that in mind, we can uh, move on to um, the first of our requirements on our short list. And this is the requirement to link uh, categories of personal data to the processing activities for which they are used, um, their purposes with lawful basis. And it is quite an onerous um, requirement. You certainly would not be able to satisfy it without having your Article 30 records. So, you know, thinking um, how do we how do we address it, uh, how to best address and present that, um, that, uh, that, that amount of information. Uh, the GPC has uh, recommended using uh, tables. And whilst it's not a necessary requirement, we think um, that it probably is the, the neatest way of, of presenting um, all those various elements and linking them, presenting them in a way that is clear and um, easy to, easiest to comprehend um, for uh, readers of your privacy notice. 
And this is the approach that WhatsApp has taken. We have also used that um, used tables in our updated precedent. You might have um, done that in your organizations or, or at least would have seen those WhatsApp style um, tables in, in other privacy notices. And here on the slide, we've put up a couple of examples to, to show how it can be done, um, a good one and a bad one. So let's, uh, let's start with a good one. Um, you can see that there is quite a lot of detail here. Um, and there are those three elements um, that we talked about, they are linked. And in fact, you can see that there is even a fourth column. So there is some additional information here uh, reference to source of information and in all, it is all done by um, specific categories of data. So that's great and it illustrates the point that um, the exact style or the level of detail that you, you choose to provide will differ depending on the complexity of your processing, um, type of your audience services that you're providing. You may choose to, to, to add some details so anything that you, you decide might be useful for people when they are reading it might enhance their understanding. That, that is great um, as long as you are yeah, adding to those minimum uh, regulatory requirements that we, we talked about. Um, okay, so let's look at the bad one now and what to, what to avoid. Um, so when you look at this one, it actually looks okay on the face of it. You know, it has those three elements. Um, they seem to be linked. You have purpose, um, legal basis, and some sort of description. But when you look closer at the description, you can see that it refers to personal data throughout the table. So it refers to personal data for all processing activities. It doesn't specify what categories of personal data are, are used. And, and this is a, a kind of key, key, um, key failure in, in, in this level of transparency that's needed. It's not sufficiently detailed and clear. Um, of course, it, it's difficult to differentiate categories for each processing activity. We totally appreciate that. So one kind of drafting tip that we would suggest um, you might want to use is to uh, define various categories of data that your organization processes upfront, so separately from this table, for example, your account data or direct marketing data, and then you can use those defined terms, reference them throughout the table, which will throughout the, the slowful basis table, which should allow you to do it in a bit more uh, succinct way. Um, and before we, we move on to, to, to further requirements, um, just to highlight that the importance of clarity in relation to lawful basis and purposes of processing really um, was a central point of um, the DPC's decision and WhatsApp decision and uh, Facebook and Instagram and then also recently uh, a key point in the ICO's TikTok decision. And the regulators are really focusing on this requirement and they are stressing how important it is and they're stressing that the, uh, the insufficient clarity in relation to lawful basis and purposes may have an impact on the fairness of processing and may really undermine um, people's understanding of what really is happening um, what the organizations are doing with their data and therefore their ability to exercise their data subject rights. So it, it goes to the core of transparency requirement in its cent and because of that it is a very important, um, important uh, requirement and one that um, once you are, uh, when you are updating your privacy notice, this one certainly uh, deserves particular attention. Um, so let's look now at how you should describe, how granular you should be when describing um, legitimate interests and legal obligations. Um, in terms of legitimate interests, um, the DPC has confirmed that you need to specify legitimate interests you rely on in relation to specific purposes. Uh, and you also need to describe those legitimate interests in a way that is meaningful. So uh, any broad brush generic descriptions will no longer be sufficient. And in terms of legal obligations, uh, well, well, the DPC has confirmed that here 
you need to refer and specify particular legislative provisions under which um, your organization processes personal data. So it's no longer sufficient to refer to types of law that may apply or may result in processing. You need to refer to specific provisions um, based on which you actually are processing personal data. There's no way you can do it without your Article 30 records at hand, but even if your Article 30 records are in good shape, it still is a very practically difficult uh, requirement to satisfy. And it's exactly what WhatsApp tried to argue, uh, but uh, the DPC uh, had very little sympathy for WhatsApp's argument. And it said that um, uh, the level of difficulty or, or the amount of effort that needs to be invested in providing the information will not really work uh, as a valid um, excuse for, for non-compliance. So, uh, yeah, as a result, uh, WhatsApp has updated their uh, privacy notice and they have included quite a lengthy list of um, legal obligations with even references to specific statutory provisions. Uh, but in practice, uh, we haven't really seen that many privacy notices where controllers have gone the full length and um, have, fully just, have chosen to fully comply with this requirement uh, in a way that the DPC has, um, has specified it. Okay, so let's move on our, now to, to, to the next area, which is the information that you will need to provide about recipients of your data. So how granular do you need to be here? Well, you, you have a choice. You can either specify recipient or you can describe categories of recipients. But if you choose not to name uh, recipients of your data, then you need to provide a full list of clearly articulated categories. So they should not be generic, referring to our business partners, for example, that will not be sufficiently um, granular. And for the, that information to be meaningful, you should establish a link between um, your service provider or, or category of service providers, uh, services that they are providing and the types of personal data that are uh, processed in the course of those services. It will, um, this, satisfying this requirement will differ depending on the complexity of your processing, but also depending on um, aspects such as, you know, are you part of a large group of companies and are you sending data, are you sharing data uh, within your group or do you use many service providers? That will of course make it uh, much more difficult to, to satisfy it in practice. Um, and you will need to consider the, the realities of your processing and find the approach that is workable for your organization. So you might uh, want to consider whether you are able to list all your um, service providers, which obviously would be an ideal solution in the eyes of uh, the regulators. But in reality, it may be that it's not doable, it's not possible, and you will choose to take a risk-based approach um, referring to, to the main ones. And something to keep in mind in this context is also the fact that it's not only about providing this information in the first place while you're updating your privacy notice, but you will need to make sure that this information remains up to date. So you will need to uh, make sure that you, you, you're updating it uh, when anything in your processing changes. So for that reason, you know, one solution that might, might work in the context of recipients, you might choose to link out to separate documents listing your either group companies or um, uh, service providers uh, because that might be just easier to update separately rather than as a part of your privacy notice. And I've been mentioning group companies and service providers, but also don't, don't forget other categories of, um, of recipients that are relevant to your processing um, with, with whom you share your personal data. And if any of those recipients are in third countries, that uh, will mean that you will also need to provide information about international data transfers. And no surprise here, that information will also need to be specific and granular. That means that you will need to refer to um, specific adequacy decisions if you're relying on them. A good way of doing it is to, to provide a link. 
you will need to also specify what types of uh, standard contractual clauses you're using. Um, so, um, as with other requirements, you will need to be specific, um, and you might you should be prepared for the fact that data subjects might ask you to provide their um, standard contractual clauses if you offer that in your privacy notice. But what makes this requirement quite uh, tricky to satisfy is uh, the fact that you should provide this information also by reference to, to categories of personal data. And also you should refer to specific countries that you are transferring your data to. So if you think about organizations with global data flows and, and, and data flows that might keep changing, that becomes a difficult uh, requirement to satisfy in, in practice. Um, so again, you will need to consider your processing and find the level of granularity that works for your organizations and that is workable at this at the point that you're working on your privacy notice. Let's move on now to the last point on our shortlist. And this point is about retention periods and uh, or retention criteria. And we probably all agree that retention is can be a tricky subject um, in itself. Uh, but in the context of you know, what information you need to provide in your privacy notice, um, you should provide either detail about specific retention periods or about retention criteria. Your the document that you'll be looking at and cross-referencing with will, um, of course, be your retention schedules. And, but even if you have retention schedules and retention policy um, that is comprehensive, you would not want to repeat that level of detail in your privacy notice. So practical challenge here would be to um, to make sure that you provide sufficient detail to describe um, any basis for your retention in a way that is meaningful to, to people. And some ways to, to provide that meaningful information, kind of easy ways to do it, would be to refer to uh, limitation periods, the most relevant uh, limitation periods, or to provide some information um, about your backup practices. But the requirement that the DPC has focused on the most in the WhatsApp decision is actually around uh, those um, uh, unobvious retention periods. So those scenarios in which data subjects might not necessarily expect that you are still um, keeping their data. For example, after they've deleted their account or after you've uh, provided services to them. So if that's the case, uh, you should be particularly transparent about it in, in your privacy notice. Um, and this is kind of, it relates to retention periods, but it's also a broader point. Um, if your processing um, may seem um, unobvious to um, data subjects, or if it's particularly invasive, then that's exactly the kind of processing that the regulators would expect you to be very upfront and, and, and transparent in your privacy notice. And that is because and that is to ensure that the information that you are providing in your privacy notice is meaningful enough uh, to allow people to understand your processing, understand what's happening, how you use it with their data, how you're using it, um, and in that way enable them to exercise their the data subject rights. Um, and I think now uh, it's back to you, Martin, for some final takeaways. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Anna, um, for that. That was a really helpful overview. Um, and I think you might just have one understatement of the year when you said that data retention is a tr tricky topic, <laughs> <laughs> left it there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, Lots, lots of things to take away from today. I think, um, but I think overall, I think we we can all agree and, and see that the the bar for for standard for privacy notices is is pretty high uh, based on the on these decisions. And you know, while not many privacy notices are are probably 100% compliant, um, you know, the, these regulatory decisions do show us what's required. And that market standards are are not always going to be your best point of reference when when assessing your own compliance. So you know, in other words, um, you know, comparison with with what others might be doing in your sector, uh, will just won't cut it with with the regulators, as we've seen. So yeah, think about what the regulators expect, um, and and we've seen that these these expectations have been broadly consistent um, across both the EU and the UK. Um, 
and uh, you know go you know as I said earlier go back revisit the articles of the GDPR look at the uh, article 29 working party transparency guides again just to, to refresh on on the on the the legal requirement and you know certainly it looks like regulatory focus on on this 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 area is, is unlikely to go away anytime soon and you know will will remain quite strong going back to the to the the title of this this webinar today you know, privacy notices are a window into your compliance and and you know the higher the standard of your privacy notice you know i think the stronger the message that sends to regulators customers you know civil society for that matter uh, more generally about you know the the level of your compliance um but you know as we touched on you know, there, there are a lot of practical challenges uh, despite what the regulators might think uh you know that we all have to deal with and and sometimes it is necessary to take more of a risk-based approach and, and and find the right place for your organization on on that kind of sliding scale of compliance which might not be 100 you know compliant right now uh, or at the moment but you know it, you know the, the key thing would be um to, to really keep in mind what you're trying to to work towards um you know and, and as i feel like i end up saying in, in all of these webinars you know don't don't let perfect be the enemy of good you know update your privacy notices as best as you can now but you know the key thing will be to to, to put a plan together and actually document the plan you know thinking about your the accountability principle and and and, and providing some audit trail to, to improve it over the course of the next three six nine twelve months whatever it may be with with updates to to get it to that level that we're uh, the, 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 that, we, that we know that regulators want. So this might give you a bit more time to to, to get to know your data again. Uh, if you haven't, you know, done, done any data mapping since 2018, um, you know, the, 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 those flows of data, maybe the vendors that you're using have been, you know, you've you've taken on a ton of new vendors that that haven't really been captured in your records. Gives you that opportunity to do that, um, and it may even just give you more time to to reformat and and and, and republish your, your your notice differently. You know, maybe that you decide to do a video after all. So as ever with, with data protection, we you know we're 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 seeking to to continuously improve from our current position, and I think that will. I know we're almost at time, Hazels, but uh, I don't know if we've got time for any questions. Thank you, thank you all very much for that very comprehensive overview of where we are with privacy notices five years on. We do have a few questions, um, and what I will do is arbitrarily pick out some. So forgive me if I've not picked your question, we will get back to you by email. Um, one question which I thought was quite interesting was um, whether we would consider the privacy notice to be a legal document. And I'd be interested for your views as well. I mean, I would say it is because it meets a legal requirement and hopefully it gets you out of a hole in some situations. But I wonder if any of other our other speakers would would take a different point of view. What do you think? I mean, I, I probably should have said that explicitly. I mean, that that probably neatly uh, summarised what I should have said of my slides covering <laughs> articles 12, 13, and 14. But essentially, that I think that was the point I'm making. That yeah, that, yeah cool. this is a legal requirement. This is a legal document that that's derived from regulatory, uh, you know, the, think, the, 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 the right. overall GDPR. So. And then um, I think I know the answer to this one, um, but I and uh, and the lady who is a friend who's asked this is a little bit cheeky because she's put a little cheeky smile after her question to say, um, do do we know of any perfect privacy notices? And I think the answer has got to be no, surely. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'd love to say field fishers, but even even that I think may not be perfect. Uh, absolutely, no, no, and then that's you know. Um, and I think certainly we see this. I think we have these kind of conversations with clients every day, and um, yeah. I, I, I don't think right. we've we've seen perfection just yet. Yeah. We're not still not yet. We, we have no, yet we're still striving to that. <laughs> so if, and if, I think if, we'll, yeah. Sorry, carry on. If, if if you are thinking about it that your privacy notice is not perfect, then you are most certainly not alone. You're in good company. I agree. I, agree. Um, I think it's. I think the best privacy notice is probably one that is a video, something like that, because it's. It, the, I don't know. The intelligibility is better, but it doesn't meet the legal requirement, probably. Anyway, I'm going to call time there because I think we're kind of running out right now. Um, thank you all very much for joining. I hope you in, enjoyed the session. I hope you find it helpful. We will follow up 
probably at the start of next week now with the slides and the recording. Um, if you have any other questions we haven't answered, let us know. And remember to join us on our LinkedIn um, and YouTube and follow us there with our data protection, key data protection fit series. Thanks very much. Bye bye.